So I loved reading the conversations you've been having about cubism and abstraction. First off, I noticed a paradox. The elusive, puzzling nature of these artistic movements known as cubism, known as abstraction, that made all of you think very hard and think very creatively. There was sort of a sense of everyone stretching their minds to deal with such intellectual problems, which is what these artworks pose, right? And it was very exciting to see how many perceptive observations were happening. For example, Mahati Hare's writing, I think one of the reasons that cubism is so baffling is because the lines between different shapes blur a lot, which makes the painting difficult to understand from one point of view. So Mahati is one of many people who are grappling or groping for a way to describe these shifting lines, these intersecting lines and how they don't seem to add up to a consistent form. And Tiara describes this very well also, right? The impression of confusion as these pieces might not be immediately understood on what the subject or object is showing, what is being depicted, right? That's the, the burning question. And Tiara says, a lot of this is due to the numerous perspectives within, fracturing each form into a flattened pictorial space. This distorted space takes away any representation of linear perspective, chiaroscuro, and the old standards of the past. Exactly. In fact, if you think back to the very beginning of this class, when you learned about the terminology and methods of art history, you had a starter kit that was breaking down elements of art. You could call that the technical components of art making such as color properties and value ranges, right? The value scale from white to black, which are all part of the process of creating an illusion. And most particularly, you learned about a picture plane and how the illusion of three-dimensional space is created on a two-dimensional surface. The dictionary definition says the art of drawing solid objects on a two-dimensional surface the illusion, that is, of solid objects, because of course there are no solid objects on a two-dimensional surface that an artist uses a canvas or a, a wooden plank. There are only illusions, but they feel solid because it gives the right impression of their height, width, depth, and position in relation to each other from when viewed from a particular point. And you learned of all the different ways to create that illusion of solid objects in a, an imaginary three-dimensional space. Linear perspective has a particular authority in that one point linear perspective here with two point here, two different ways of doing linear perspective, because it's very consistent because it's mathematically determined and it is, has a single vanishing point or two, but a single viewing point, a stable viewing point. So here you have the same kind of lines at angles that suggest depth, but there is no single stable viewing point that allows you to imagine all of these elements to create a solid object in an illusionistic space. Some of these little cubes seem to project outward, some to cut back, but it's never consistent of a foreground and a background. It makes sense that cubism is called cubism because it's referring to these cubes that are the simplest way to represent the idea of an illusion of solid objects in deep space. But the illusion is being disassembled. So one of the things that's great to see in these conversations is how many of you were able to really skillfully describe the experience of being baffled. Unlike other forms of art that I can bite off pieces of, analyze, and maybe come to some conclusion, cubism makes me feel as if I have no breaking off point to even begin to form a coherent idea. My eyes move too fast, trying to follow the forms as I think they would naturally lead, but partway I get lost in the maze of overlapping shapes and planes. A maze of overlapping shapes and planes. Look at how Grace arrived at a fantastic description of 
a cubist painting like the portrait of Kahnweiler from the position of having been of struggle, of struggling to understand it. And the problem, of course, lies not in cubism, but in our own minds, which incessantly demand that the cubist artwork should fit into the templates that we already have in place. And so we set ourselves up to be frustrated. So Edith very astutely says, you know, I find it confusing that about cubism in that people are able to see a form within it, right? Like, I can't see a form. Actually, she's right. There is no, no coherent, solid form that is constructed in a systematic, consistent way that matches how we see forms in life. So Picasso teases us to try to look for a form by titling it Portrait of Daniel Henry Conviler, but there is no solid form. You can look and find things that you go, aha, maybe that there, those lines, those are fingers clasped. You can find little details on the suit that you start to pick up like stray pieces of a puzzle, as some people in the conversation beautifully suggested. This is puzzle-like, but the puzzle pieces are really hard to fit together. Some of them seem to be projecting out, some of them going back. Is it flat? Is it illusionistic? It's not consistent. So Picasso and Brock here are breaking from the idea that art is about mimesis. Mimesis comes from Greek, and it goes back to the Greeks, the idea that what art ought to be doing is representing or imitating the real world. In fact, mimesis is the source word, the root word for memes, as we know today, memes. It's also related to the term mimicry, to imitate the appearance of the natural world. And this moment here, what Edith does is really helpful. She brings in this Picasso quote, which is critical. I paint forms as I think them, not as I see them. Seeing them would be the optical truth of what things look like. But he's saying painting for him will no longer be about optical reality, but about conceptual reality. And this relates to a wonderful insight that Taras made, um, that Besides just this revolutionary move of breaking up the subject into geometric fragments and separated planes, he talked about, where did it go? The color, the absence of color. There it is. He talks about the color. Why is it so reduced? Why is it so stripped of the joy of color? I mean, in 1905, you've got André Durand playing with color in this magnificent, luxurious way, as if color is freedom and joy, just moving across the canvas. Why would you give this up? And Taurus's comment is very helpful here in that he, he quotes Zucker and Harris saying, reducing color allows us to focus on mind, form, structure. True enough. But then Taurus adds something important, that he thinks of this radical reduction helps separate the work from everything else that was happening in painting at the time, definitely from Matisse, right? Or from Durin. And it also suggests something about the new violent reality of the 20th century in which the artwork seems to belong to the sphere of machines rather than humans. That is very important. This idea that the machine age is ushering a new kind of person, a new man, as it was said at the time, also a new woman, who is a person who is a, a creature of a prosthesis that is the machine. The machine are prosthetic enhancements of the human mind and body, and the machines define us from this time going forward. So summing up, I want to suggest that all of these things are part of cubism, which is not reducible to any one of them which is one of the comments that Taras made as well, right? So we have multiple reference points in this artwork. We have reference points to the traditional art technologies of illusionism, of perspective being disassembled, as well as the traditional art technologies of using light and shadow to create modeling or to create atmosphere. And yet that's being sort of scattered to become a play on the surface. But we also have a 
a vision of the portrait, the person in the portrait and the person making the artwork as closer to mechanics and to science, as well as to popular culture of cafes and bars than to the high culture of the past, right? So Kahnweiler has these hands like cartoon hands because he's referencing the kind of mass culture posters that advertised pubs and bars, restaurants and spectacles. But there's also a sense that this is being informed by how science at the time is beginning to more and more divulge that the Newtonian physical world that is consistent and clear is actually going to is slowly being undermined as scientists are talking about atomic particles, about light being a wave and a particle, and about the complexity and dynamic uncertainty of the world. In other words, everyone was getting a new picture of the world and of themselves. And the old kind of picturing that just looks at how things look, it was not, it doesn't work anymore. 